with the first educational talk, which is Jeremy Collins, who's going to talk about contrast enhanced MRA in the body, including large venous structures, I understand. Alrighty. That's a little bit better. Uh, thanks again for the invitation to speak. My only disclosure is research funding by Estellas as a, a co investigator, and then I'll mention the use of Ferrahim Ferramoxifol as off label uh, for contrast enhanced MR angiography. So the outline here, I'll talk about some uh, common abdominal uh, contrast enhanced MRA techniques, review some uh, established applications, talk about some evolving applications, as well as get into uh, some functional vascular uh, imaging with MR. So here's some the common techniques. I think we're all very familiar with these. There's conventional first pass imaging. There's time resolved, dynamic contrast enhanced MRA, uh, pseudo steady state imaging. And then um, also, as was uh, talked about the other day, uh, subtractionless contrast in summary using the Dixon methods. So I don't have a good example of this in the abdomen, but I'm sure we've seen this all the time in the lower extremities. What I really like about this slide is you can't tell in the calves, but one of these two is with contrast. So try to figure out which one you think has contrast. And there were the answers, right? So this is one of the reasons that MR is so useful. The same issues occur, of course, up in the abdomen. Very heavily calcified vessel origins, hard to see around those structures with both uh, angiography and CT. Uh, ultrasound has some of the same limitations. MR, of course, doesn't have any of those issues. So image on the left is a conventional contrast enhanced MRA exam. Uh, this was uh, a little bit of a longer breath hold. There's highly high variability in how long the breathless are based on acceleration. You can uh, use lower amounts, uh, larger amounts of contrast on based on various factors. This one was obtained with a single dose. And the image on the right is a time resolve uh, MR angiogram in a patient who has chronic pelvic pain and a nice example of retrograde flow in the left uh, ovarian vein, which you can see here going to the pelvis with pelvic varicosities. Um, subtraction. Well, subtraction is important from a post-processing perspective. Um, if you don't do the subtracted images, it's harder to communicate some of the findings with your referring colleagues who don't want to look at thousands of images to look at vascular pathology. They want to look at a few that represent all of the anatomy. The image on the left here is without subtraction. Fortunately, contrast is only in the arteries, but there's still a lot of overlapping structures. Image on the right with subtraction, much easier to appreciate uh, the relevant vascular anatomy without anything overlapping there. Uh, steady state imaging, so you can do this with blood pool contrast agents. Um, Ablovar used to be available, as we all know, for this. Nowadays, it would be Ferrahim, Ferramoxetol. You can give it either in, this, uh, in the waiting area, bring the patients into the imaging suite, and then image in the steady state, or give it in the angio, uh, if it, excuse me, in the MRI suite, and uh, have the images obtained at various points after contrast administration as it becomes a blood pool agent. The point here is that you have excellent opacification of the arteries and the veins, and the challenge is just timing it out so you can get an acquisition in a reasonable breath hold or do under, in this situation as it was here, under conditions of free breathing, targeting uh, the relevant anatomy with uh, some motion artifact in the upper abdomen, but the focus here, of course, was in the pelvis, being able to see the arteries and veins uh, robustly. Um, so subtractionless MRA using the Dixon method has been described several talks yesterday about this. What's really nice about this approach is you don't have to worry about misregistration between the mask and the contrast enhanced imaging. Instead, you have fat water separation. It can use that robustly to separate out the bright signal from the fat and the contrast enhanced arteries and or venous structures, as you can see in this patient with pretty extensive atherosclerotic disease. Um, this has been extended more recently to subtractionless and whole body, highly accelerated MR angiography with compressed sensing. This is an iteration on previous work by this group. Initially, the total scan time was around 30 minutes, and now it's dropped to about 10 minutes. Because of the way the contrast is administered, it's still a decent total contrast uh, administration amount, total of uh, uh, 0.3 millimoles per kilogram, so a triple, triple dose, if you will. But this is a nice approach that's very time efficient for whole body screening. And I know that we have a lot of non-contrast MR applications and techniques out there that allow us to do this, but I would argue this is fairly time efficient from a patient perspective and allows whole body screening. Why would you wanna do this? Well, I know that I wouldn't be advocating this for every patient, but in certain patient groups, such as those at risk for aneurysms throughout the body, this is a very time efficient, perhaps I'd say practical way to screen them to see if they have manifestations of their underlying uh, genetic disease. 
Just some example images of what you can get with typical contrast enhanced MR angiography applications in the abdomen. You can see distal uh, breast, uh, vessel branching here, uh, trifurcation of the left hepatic artery denoted by the arrow. You can of course see widely varying extents of obstructive vascular disease. We simply don't get a lot of these referrals anymore because it's a lot easier to, I think, order and get CT imaging by our vascular colleagues. That's just the way things have gone. However, in patients who have a little bit more complex anatomy or renal dysfunction, I think we still see these, tend to see these referrals quite frequently. So this patient, for example, has you know, uh, a missing kidney on the right, and they have severe stenosis in the left renal origin. This is a patient with a hepatic arterial graft, and there's stenosis here right at the graft and anastomosis. Uh, a very common reason for patients being referred, at least at Mayo Clinic, for contrast enhanced MRA in the abdomen remains renal artery stenosis. This is a classic example of fibromuscular dysplasia in the right renal artery, which was confirmed on angiography and treated with balloon angioplasty with an improved uh, luminal caliber. Uh, dynamic imaging is really great. This allows a lot more uh, of an assessment of the blood flow uh, through the region of interest, can isolate out the arterial feeder in uh, draining veins, and in this patient with a large renal AVM, I think you can see it very, very well, and this was confirmed with uh, catheter angiography and used a ridiculous number of coils as well as a guide wire to ultimately embolize this very large uh, AVM. Uh, one of the things that I really like about uh, MR here is you can use multi-phase imaging, and this allows you to, with confidence, increasingly get contrast to surround structures like this, clot in the portal vein, which otherwise would be difficult to appreciate. The first pass image here doesn't really show much. You can see the caliber of the, of the uh, portal vein there. There's a little bit of a suggestion of a bright structure here, and on delayed phase imaging, you can appreciate the contrast filling in around that clot, which is really well seen. These are .mov files, so I couldn't quite show the full extent of the clot, but the point here is that delayed phase imaging, even without a blood flow contrast agent, is extremely valuable at contrast enhanced MR angiography. Uh, vasculitis, a great application for contrast enhanced MRA. You can couple this with um, uh, T1 weighted imaging pre and post and look at wall thickness. You can see the thickening surrounding the SMA. There is narrowing of the abdominal aorta in this patient as well, history of Takayasu's arteritis, but no active inflammation on these images here. This is a different patient. Um, this patient has a T2 signal and a thickened abdominal aortic wall here. This is the pre-contrast image, early and late enhancement, showing progressive enhancement of the wall in this patient with active uh, large vessel vasculitis. What about this patient? This is a patient from Mayo. Uh, this is a reformatted MRA. There's some thickening here, seen along the descending thoracic aorta. Um, not sure what that is. Uh, this is a different tissue weighting that was obtained. Image on the left, double IRT1, uh, with fat suppression in the middle, and then a T2-weighted image with fat suppression on the right. You can see that there's a dark overall T2 signal within this, and it is T1 hyperintense. Uh, easy to appreciate this, I think, with fat suppression in the felt. And the image on the right here, again, is that same image I showed earlier. Image on the left now is a delayed enhanced image. T1 waiting about five minutes or so after contrast. You can see that there's a change in the signal, so it perhaps is enhancing a little bit. Um, pre and post images here uh, showing the same appearance. This is on the right, obtained at about five minutes after contrast administration. So again, T1 hyper intense, perhaps a little bit of peripheral enhancement. At Mayo, we do a lot of imaging. So this patient did get a PET CT. There was concern this could be uh, an actual um, tumor, but this is a subacute intramural hematoma seen differently. So one of the challenges with using MR in patient groups we don't typically use it is you'll see pathology that's typically seen in classic in appearance with CT that might have a different appearance with MR, and we have to be able to interpret that accurately without leading to additional imaging tests performed to further evaluate those findings. Um, this is a case I got from Albert Sal at UCSD. This is a patient who has chronic pelvic pain, a couple of uh, axial, sagittal, and coronal images post-contrast. Uh, this is a delayed phase image showing some pelvic varicosities in enlarged ovarian vein here. Uh, and you can see this enlarged vein coming down to those pelvic varicosities on the left, as well as an enlarged right-sided ovarian vein. And so in a patient with chronic pelvic pain, you want to get a sense of it, not just are there varices, but is there a connection between those pelvic varices and uh, the, typically the left renal vein. And you can see nicely on this image 
similar to what I showed earlier from a time resolved MR angiogram, that there is retrograde flow in this uh, left ovarian vein going down to the pelvis. So this would be supportive of pelvic congestion syndrome, and this can be treated with coil embolization and IR. Uh, another case, this is a great mimic case. Got this one from Albert as well. So we have uh, axial, coronal, and sagittal images here in a patient who has, again, chronic pelvic pain. And if you kind of look at the size of these vessels, something similar to what I showed in the last case, but there's an important difference with this one that we'll get through in some of the next images. So to take a look here at the IVC. It's hard to really appreciate anything in that location. So we see a lot of, we see a lot of collateral vessels in the retroperitoneum, and we don't really see a nice IVC here. And this patient has chronic pelvic pain. And this is a uh, axial zoomed in image showing something similar. Let's see if I can see it from here. Oops, sorry. Yep. And you have the arrows here showing the size of the, uh, of the uh, ovarian veins, very large, right? And there was a missing structure where the IVC should be. And then a little bit higher up, pretty impressively enlarged uh, peripelvic vein, uh, uh, perivertebral veins here. So collateral veins. Dynamic imaging with the same acquisition I showed for the last patient doesn't really show the typical appearance of the renal vein coming in and retrograde flow down at the pelvis. And instead, we're just barely seeing some of these veins come in at the end of the acquisition. And 40 fluomeri confirms that there's flow in a direction that would not be suspected in somebody who would have a typical pelvic congestion syndrome type appearance. Instead, the flow is collateral flow, bypassing the segment of abnormality within the IVC getting back to the heart. And so this is showing a little bit better with the coronal acquisition, and this uh, full volume uh, 40 flow MRI data set shows the extent of these collateral pathways that have popped up to bypass um, the occlusion in the IVC. And this is a patient who had a history of IVC ligation, and the IVC was reconstructed in, in IR. So an important component of it's not just you have a large ovarian vein, pelvic congestion syndrome, go and occlude those, those vessels, that might be a, a real problem. Uh, Farahim MRA is something we've been using pretty frequently at Mayo Clinic uh, when there's any concerns with giving contrast, gadolinium-based contrast. It's not exactly a, a very common uh, issue now with gadolinium-based contrast, but we still use Farahim uh, for a few different indications for just artery evaluation alone. This is from the Florida practice showing really nicely an inferenal abdominal aortic aneurysm as well as some mural thrombus. I mean, this has excellent image quality. If you image it in the first pass, it's really easy to get the volume rate images like I've, uh, or the MIP images like I have on the right. But if you image it in the steady state, that's obviously gonna be a little bit more difficult. This is a, a, a case I got from Paul Finn, showing really nicely how you can uh, have steady state imaging, paramoxifal MRA to help with uh, pre-procedure planning in patients with renal failure. And this is a fusion images uh, showing calcification is obtained with non-contrast CT. And of course, this allows you to do uh, measurements of the, of the aorta with great accuracy. Endoleak evaluation, this is something that we were using at uh, MR4 a little bit more frequently in the past than we are now. It's a very sensitive technique, perhaps one could say overly sensitive, uh, but it allows us to identify the presence of a suspected endoleak, I think, with great conspicuity. This is a, a, a paper that published um, back in 2008 and showed the pretty high rate of endoleak, not just detection, but characterization with time-resolved MR angiography. And in this review paper, the authors described a technique where they were using ablovar to do the same. So time-resolved MR with ablovar followed by delayed phase imaging to confirm the presence of an endoleak. Um, dissections are really well uh, assessed with uh, contrast-enhanced MR angiography. Again, we don't tend to see a lot of these referred primarily for MR, tend to be done with CT, but coupled with 40 flow imaging allows us to really get a great sense of function and understand the flow within the true and the false lumina, which may be an interesting marker for progression. Um, there's been a couple of different studies looking at MRE, derived wall stiffness, and how that might uh, link in with uh, aneurysm progression. But a recent paper uh, highlighted that there are differences seen in aneurysm stiffness with MRE between groups of patients that progress and those that don't with abdominal aortic aneurysm. So interesting data that uh, might uh, show us the way to go in terms of going beyond vessel size and, uh, and outcomes. A couple barriers to MRA growth, and then I'll wrap up here. Um, I think some of the challenges we've seen is that CT images are really well interpreted by referring clinicians. MR images, maybe not so much. 
there's a lot of uh, a need for standardization of reporting. Uh, we want to make sure that when we talk about, say, plaque characteristics or flow characteristics, we're doing so in a standard way that the, our referring colleagues can interpret. Our vendors need to help us, I think, in terms of ensuring that the quantitation we do is, is accurate and, and consistent. And I'll just leave you with this. The AUC that we have out there, appropriate use criteria, would indicate that CT and MR are equivalent for many different conditions, but you'll notice that we don't use MR as often as we should based on this alone. And with that, I'll wrap up. Thanks very much for your attention.